I'm Walter Bosley, author of Shimmering Light, Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu, a story of paperclip Nazis, Roswell UFOs, a lost race, and perception management. Available only print on demand at lulu.com. Chapter 3 My dad always said that Wright-Patterson Air Force Base played a role in the crash mystery. The stream of Roswell literature since 1980 says the same. There must have been a good reason. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is the home of the 88th Air Base Wing and Air Force Material Command. In existence as two separate Army Air Corps fields since 1917, Wright-Patterson became a combined base in 1948 when the U.S. Air Force was created by the National Security Act of 1947. The base had always been a research and development center for U.S. military air power and also played a role in the development of the U.S. manned space program prior to and during the establishment of NASA. It is the Air Force Materiel Command wherein the mysterious secrets can be found. With that in mind, let's go back to 1958 when my dad said he was sent to Wright-Patterson to be briefed on what happened in the infamous, legendary, and notorious Roswell Incident. The Roswell Part of the Story I'm going to assume that the overwhelming majority of readers of this book are familiar with the generalities of that which is Roswell. We are told all the time that the bodies and the pieces of the craft were flown to Wright Pat where they were studied and the craft was reverse engineered. Since I was first hearing about some of this from my father before the 1980 book by Moore and Berlitz, I have always recognized my dad's tale basically jibes with the circumstantial facts and even more so with the popular legend. Unless my dad knew Stanton Friedman personally or his work before telling me his version, and I have no reason nor evidence that he did, I will proceed under the assumption that he wasn't lying or merely confused with something he might have seen on a TV show or read in a magazine or obviously in any of the subsequent books on Roswell. Wright Patterson was where the bodies and material were sent according to my dad's version and in all others. So let's look at this base within the Roswell context. Which specific units at Wright Patterson in the late 1950s might have logically had custodianship of the recovered alien bodies and their craft. The Air Technical Intelligence Center, or ATIC, was indeed present at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1958, the year in question. ATIC was a field unit of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence and is known for analyzing captured or recovered foreign aircraft. It became the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, a tenant organization at Wright-Patterson today. As an arm of Air Force Intelligence, ATIC was also attached to certain requirements of Air Material Control Department, and that brings us right back to AFMC, a host command of the base. This strongly suggests that the facts support the inclusion of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the Roswell story. Why would my father, a mere staff sergeant, be briefed in on such an important piece of information, such as allegedly recovered bodies and a craft of unknown origin? It's all need to know. The answer to the above question is my dad's job in the Air Force, as described earlier. He conducted inspections of aircraft oxygen systems and personal equipment such as helmets and masks and performed maintenance on these items. He also ran pilots through the altitude chamber and briefed them on procedures. Such briefings included related aerospace medicine aspects of pilot training and evaluation. This specialty in the ground testing of the Mercury spacesuits would have logically attached him to classified U.S. Air Force and, eventually, NASA space program research and development, and that would most certainly provide the all-important need to know. My dad's specialty was at the heart of these things. With his need to know established, it becomes credible that my father could indeed have observed and studied the remains of alleged otherworldly travelers, because it would provide much data invaluable to doing his job. How the environment through the mysterious craft flew, 
and the subsequent crash particulars affected the physiology of the recovered bodies would be data critical to my dad's specialty. And then I found something truly delightful. There was a little nugget of gold among my dad's official paperwork that even better argues his need to know about the recovered bodies. You will recall the previously mentioned, in a previous chapter, George Air Force Base or GAFB Form 101, which describes his job, including equipment maintenance duties. In the job description box at the bottom was added at some point in his career the following task, worded simply, Casualty Collection Team Number 1, followed by Building Number 630. This made the investigator in me very happy. It's called evidence and among the best kind. But evidence of what? Being on a casualty collection team meant that my father was involved in the retrieval of material and specifically bodies from crashes. This means to me that it is indeed possible for my dad to have viewed bodies retrieved from whatever might have crashed in New Mexico sometime after World War II. If it was determined to be a U.S. Air Force space science and aviation medicine matter, it would be logical for Air Force doctors and aviation medicine specialists to be keenly interested in the effects of the crash on the victim's physiology. Whether a human physiology or one allegedly not ours, useful scientific data could be collected if the craft were indeed alien, aka foreign, and capable of spaceflight, extraterrestrial or not. I propose that my father's assignment on a casualty collection team lends credibility to his claim to have seen the alleged Roswell crash bodies. Intrigued with the discovery on my dad's GAFB Form 101, I hoped to learn more about this casualty collection team. There was a building identifier, for starters. Locating Building 630 may be impossible if it was located at George Air Force Base, now inactive and deteriorating. Incidentally, that building number does exist at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, presently as a child care center. If Building 630 was indeed a building at George, I can fairly presume that it was a medical facility for obvious reasons related to my dad's assignment. But I just don't know. It could also have been a staging area in a hangar. Did my dad ever speak of casualty collections? Over the years, he told me stories of the pilots who had crashed and specifically of the death of Ivan C. Kinchlow, Korean War fighter ace and test pilot who was killed at Edwards Air Force Base on the 26th of July, 1958, while my dad was back east. He had run Kinchlow through the altitude chamber on a few occasions and was acquainted with him. Kinchlow was the first man known to fly above 100,000 feet, earning him the brief nickname America's number one spaceman. Selected for the X-15 program, Ivan Kinchlow was killed while ejecting from a malfunctioning F-104 over Edwards Air Force Base, victim of the not-so-brilliant idea of downward ejection employed in that model of aircraft at the time. The Kinchlow story was one my dad would tell of crash retrieval activities, even though he was not at Edwards when it happened. However, he would go to Edwards in the course of his duties at George, something my mom distinctly remembers about the remaining days my dad had in the Air Force after they got married. He also told a story about one gruesome crash after which he saw the deceased pilot's favorite scarf blowing across the ground on the flight line. I can't recall which pilot that was. With the GAFB Form 101 positively identifying my dad with a crash retrieval team at his base, it could also have qualified him to pull the same duty at any U.S. Air Force location. I say in this piece of data on the form we have enough corroboration to his story in this regard, slight as it may still seem to some. So what do we have regarding Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that suggests my father was telling the truth about being taken there to be briefed on an alien craft and its occupants, that the base would be the place for such aerospace material and information, and that my dad's duties would provide a double need to know about recovered pilot or flight crew bodies. Yet, there is even more. 
Let's look at the Roswell incident and see what is useful, if anything. In the lore surrounding Roswell, we have Burlitz and Moore's presentation of a memo written by Mead Lane of the Borderland Sciences Research Foundation, obtained prior to writing the 1980 Roswell incident book, in which the problematic second-hand testimony of Grady Barnett, as filtered through a Dr. Weisberg, cites a so-called description of the aliens. The Lane memo states the bodies were seared by intense heat inside the craft and that an alleged autopsy demonstrated the occupant resembled a normal human body except in size. In another part of the Moore Burlitz book, Barnett is claimed to have said the bodies were also without hair. It goes on to state that the bodies and wreckage were put on a train to California and transported to Muroc, the base that became Edwards, and was then transported through Fort Worth before ending up at Wright Field, specifically in building 18A Area B. There's a lot there. First, we have what appears to be corroboration of my dad's claim that the bodies recovered from the Roswell wreckage were human, including a reference to their size, which my dad said was smaller than the average human, though not as small as the popular depiction of ETs, and that they were hairless, another detail my dad alleged. Then we have the bodies and craft being sent by train to Muroc or Edwards, where it's all put on a plane and flown to Wright Field in Ohio. There is mention of unusual wreckage being sent to Fort Worth. Here we have Wright Patterson solidly in the lore by 1980, plus Texas bases, which corroborate what we know about U.S. Air Force aviation medicine history and my dad's background. My question about this part of the Barnett story is why would the U.S. Army Air Corps place such an important retrieval on a train? My only explanation for placing the bodies and wreckage on a train is that perhaps the guys calling the shots felt it would be more physically secure, but was a train less likely to wreck than a plane was to go down? I'm sure one concern was to protect such valuable material, yet the Air Corps transporting via rail instead of on one of their own airplanes remains curious nonetheless. They ultimately put debris on a plane to Ohio anyway. Why the train? Cited also in the Moore Berlitz book is the Barry Goldwater incident in which the Senator, a reserve U.S. Air Force officer, supposedly visited Wright Patterson where he asked his pal, General Curtis LeMay, if he could see the legendary Blue Room. This room allegedly housed the Roswell bodies and debris. LeMay responded gruffly and shut down Goldwater's inquiry by telling the Senator to never ask again. The point here isn't whether this tale is true or not, but to point out yet another inclusion of the Wright-Patterson base in Roswell lore. Probably the best corroboration in placing Wright-Patterson in the mix of whatever Roswell was or is can be found in the FBI teletype dated 8 July 1947, in which it is stated that a disc and a balloon retrieved from crash site near Roswell, New Mexico, were being transported to Wright Field. This teletype was apparently sent from the FBI office in Dallas to the special agent in charge in Cincinnati, Ohio, the nearest field office and just a half hour or so drive from Wright Field. It should be noted that the original newspaper articles that stood as the only public documentation about the so-called Roswell incident did not mention Wright Field. Only a reference to the retrieved material being flown to a higher headquarters was mentioned in print by these sources. We can certainly assume that this would likely have meant right field, but the exclusion of any identifier beyond higher headquarters makes my dad's statement that it was Wright Patterson a valid corroboration. I remind the reader that he told me this prior to the release of the Moore Burlitz book, the first book on the subject. Following the Moore Burlitz book, we have Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt in their 1991 book, UFO Crash at Roswell, and Stanton Friedman and Don Berliner presenting information in their 1992 book, Crash at Corona, furthering a Wright-Patterson association with the recovered bodies and material from Roswell. These authors cite the in-depth analyses of the debris by the Air Material Command, the early incarnation of the aforementioned AFMC, located at Wright-Patterson since the 1940s. And now we come to Corso. In the 1994 book, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, authors K. 
Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt present many alleged Roswell witnesses, among them one who claimed the bodies and wreckage were flown aboard a C-54 to Wright Field. It is with the subsequent 1997 book, The Day After Roswell, by Colonel Philip Corso, that the Roswell tale notches up and further corroborates a Wright-Patterson connection. I will be going deeper into the Corso material later in this book, because it does bear a major impact on my dad's story and my tentative conclusions, regardless of the issues raised about Corso's credibility and the credibility of the entire Roswell milieu. There remains, in spite of all the revelations of lies and deceptions associated with the Roswell witnesses and legend, something quite valid, and very unpopular, in Corso's tale that resonates directly with my dad's account and in his Air Force service. It will also return us to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. In a final note to tie up the assertion that the famed Ohio base would serve as a center for government focus on the mystery of UFOs and who flies them, I share with you the words of... Olavo Fontes of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization in 1958, and I quote, Only the persons who work on the problem know the real situation. Intelligence officers in the Army, Navy, Air Force, some high-ranking officers in the High Command, the National Security Council, and a few scientists whose activities are connected with it, and a few members of certain civilian organizations doing research for a military project. End quote. Intelligence officers, scientists, and military research, all at Wright-Patterson for decades. And there's that year again, 1958, the year my dad says the events examined in this book happened. In this chapter, I have demonstrated that Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is indeed the location where all things Roswell would end up for analysis and exploitation. Wright-Patterson has the pertinent intelligence and research units. I have also demonstrated that my dad was assigned to a casualty collection team, which is another way to say crash retrieval, and certainly could have included said function. Through casualty collection duties, my dad is further linked to the interests of Wright-Patterson in a case of foreign technology crash retrieval. Wright-Patterson is linked to the crash report in an FBI memo, not to mention the 30 years or so of Roswell lore and literature. With it reasonably demonstrated that my dad was what he said he was and likely might have had to go to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is positively associated with the Roswell issue, we can continue with this analysis. We can proceed to the weirdest part of my dad's tale. As we move on, consider next what Bruce Rux writes in Architects of the Underworld. And I quote, The government began investigating the possibility that the race behind the unknown spacecraft was one parallel to our own and connected to human life from antiquity no later than 1958. End quote. Again, with 1958, that year my dad claimed his encounter with the hidden lost race occurred. Where is this idea coming from, and why did they specifically begin to consider the idea of a parallel race in 1958. Let us now follow the rabbit to the mysterious and exotic land called Arizona. Shimmering Light, Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu, a story of paperclip Nazis, Roswell UFOs, a lost race, and perception management, is available print on demand only at lulu.com.